In this video, you'll learn how to buy your first investment property with the least amount of risk and the least amount of activation. I'm going to be covering location, property, funding, contract, offers, and management in this video. For those of you who don't know me, I bought my first investment property back in 1997. It was in a place called Fry and Barnet in London, N11. I bought this for the grand amount of £65,000, where the Bank of England interest rates back then were 7% and they were rising. And that property rented for £650 per month. I didn't know a lot about property back then, but what I did know is that property was positive cash flow and that generated me over £200 a month in passive income. Since then I've gone on to buy commercial and residential property in the UK, Australia and the US. With my most recent purchase being this year, a commercial tenanted office that generates 87 grand a year. Investing in property has become my passion and I do believe this is the best way to build wealth for yourself and to leave a lasting legacy for your family. No doubt you're concerned about recession at the moment, the rising inflation, the high interest rates and the high cost of living that we're all experiencing. But all of these things existed in the 90s when I first started investing. But all it matters is that you're buying positive cash flow property from day one. And that's what this video is gonna really help you do. The first thing you need to do is to become an area expert. Buying in an area that you don't know much about is pretty risky and it can be a costly mistake as this can severely derail your ability to grow your own property portfolio. Talk to agents, set up property alerts, get to know the prices for all the different types of properties in that area. This way when a property hits the market and it's on a good price, you're in a position to move fast. Get out there and walk the streets. Understand where the best streets are in that area, where the worst streets are in that area, and why that is, and what's the difference in between, and kind of walk them at different times of the day, just to see what's happening in the neighborhood at those different times. Is there loads of noise? Is there suddenly a massive rush of people at certain times of the day? Is it like a cut through street where during rush hour, there's all the traffic banked up, no one can get in or out. It's a nightmare getting in or out. Parking's really difficult at certain times of the day. It's good to know these types of things. You're not gonna get this just by looking at street maps or potentially looking, talking to an agent. You need to actually get out there, walk the streets and do this type of thing for yourself. But you put the hard work in now, you'll get rewarded for it later because when a property comes up in that particular street or that, those streets that you've identified, you can move fast. I recommend going and at least talking to three different agents in the particular area that you've identified that you kind of like to invest in. We wanna be doing this so we get a diverse set of opinions. We don't just wanna get one person's opinion because they might have only been in that area for a short amount of time. When you're talking to agents, find out how long they've been an agent, how long have they been in particular that area as well, and find out if they even if they live in that area, they might well do. They're gonna be able to bring you a lot more knowledge about that area. If there's an agent that's just been working in that office for six months, he lives on the other side of town, uh, first time being in that area, don't bother wasting your time on that guy or person. You wanna be talking to someone else that's been there for a long time, uh, and knows that area well, been an agent in that particular location for a long time, ideally. When we're thinking of properties, we're also thinking of tenants. So we need to be thinking about our tenant profile when we're looking at buying a property. What type of tenant's gonna go into this type of property? Because if it's a three bed house, is it gonna be going to families? Or if it's a three bed house in certain areas, could it be a HMO? It could be going to young sharers, or it could be going to students or nurses, depends on the area or if it's an owner-occupied area that's great for families, it's got a playground nearby and it's got great schools nearby, it's in certain catchment areas, then that property would appeal more to families rather than say students. So this is what you're trying to do at this stage is build up that tenant profile and build up the type of property that you wanna be buying based on what's the most in demand for that area. Is it more student focused? Is it more family focused? What's in the demand? Where can you generate the most amount of rent? And this is the type of questions you'll be talking to the agents and go and talk to some of the neighbors in the area as well and say, what's it like on this street? Do you enjoy living here? How long have you lived here? Ask these questions of the neighbors. Don't be afraid. Someone's out gardening. Just go up to them and say, hey, I'm thinking of buying in this area. What do you think of it? How long have you been here? 
When you're walking with streets, the more you do it, the more you'll start to recognize owner-occupied properties versus tenant properties. What you'll find is that owner-occupied properties are all neatly gardened, they're all looked after, and they're all weeded. You go to tenant properties and you'll find that they're not looked after as much. There's weeds, the hedges are overgrown, the grass hasn't been cut for weeks. And this is just the nature of the tenants versus owner occupiers. Tenants don't care about as much for the property, they're just living there to live there. <laughs> Whereas the owner occupiers take pride in their house, they've invested in their house, the house is worth something to them, they're gonna look after it and maintain it over the period of time that they're living there. And this type of information can then help you determine whether you wanna invest in that particular area because there might be more tenants than you care to buy in that area because Every house in that area looks like it's not being looked after. So do you wanna buy in that same area? If you're in a street where every, every house is looked after, you buy an owner-occupied house, but you're gonna rent it out to a family and hope that they're gonna look after it the same way everyone else is in the street, more than likely they will do, and that's because they're potentially gonna be there in the long term, especially if you've got young kids. It might be that they wanna to go to school in the area, which will then tie them to that particular area so they can keep going to that school. And they'll likely be there for more than just 12 months. Student properties, you've got high attrition. There's a turnover all the time, but if it's in a good demand area, then you're always gonna rent it because there's maybe more demand than there is supply. Another key thing when you're looking at areas is the crime rate. Now we can easily go and research this just on Google, putting crime rate and putting the local area, and then you can look at all the different crimes that have been committed within that area. And then you might be able to narrow down as to particular which streets have got worse types of crime than other types of crime. And this can really help you drill down to say, okay, that area I don't want to be in, I wanna be in this area where there's less types of stuff. You can even go and look at the local police website and they may give you extra information about the types of crime that's happening, the types of streets it's happening on, what's been happening in the area, crime related. You also wanna be looking at the schools. How well are the schools performing? Are they good, are they outstanding? Which streets are in catchment areas for say the outstanding schools? It's a key consideration if you're looking for like the three bed family home. If you can buy in the catchment areas for those, they're always gonna be in demand. Once you've decided on an area and a likely tenant profile, you can then narrow it down to the type of property that you wanna buy. This is also gonna be driven by your budget, but this is also gonna be driven by your understanding of the area and the type of tenant that you wanna to rent to, because there's more demand for that type of tenant maybe, or you can get a better return for that type of tenant. One particular consideration is if you're gonna be renting to sharers, you may need to get a HMO license, so housing multiple occupancy license. This is the case for anything with five people or more that are unrelated where they're sharing toilets, bathrooms and kitchens. And it's a potential for people where there's, for properties where there's more than three people in that particular property. You can go and check this online at the local council website as to whether you actually need a HMO license for three or more people in your property that are unrelated. In parallel to all of this, you need to be saving some money because you need to get together your deposit. One way to do this is obviously to save your salary, but don't just save it and put it in a bank. Potentially, depending on your attitude to risk, is you take that money and you invest it into stocks or crypto even to generate an additional return on that money while you're trying to build that up. And this way you might be able to build it up a bit quicker. You might be able to get a 10% return over the time that you're saving that money and investing that money. Potentially risky if you're doing it in crypto, it's very volatile. In certain stocks like index funds, like the S&P 500 is something that's quite safe. I invest in that one. I do invest in crypto, but only kind of amount of money that I'm prepared to lose or I'm not too fussed about. And this is because the interest rates right now are like 2% or something. They are going up, but it's not really the, as good as the returns that you could make if you had to put that same amount of money, put it in the stock market or put it on some crypto. Another way to get your deposit fast is to borrow money from your friends and family. You can potentially get this at a zero percentage rate and have flexible terms to pay it. Even if they charge you a bit of interest, doesn't matter, it's worth it in the end because it'd be less than what you'd be paying from the bank. Plus you get flexible terms, no doubt. They're not gonna hold you to it if you miss a payment or if you're late. It's not the same. It's friends and family, everything's kind of mates rates. Another thing that I've done is I've just sold unwanted stuff that's just around the house that you no longer need. 
you know, you might have an expensive bike, a mountain bike or something like that that you don't use anymore, or use it once a year, do you really need it? It's worth a thousand pounds. Go and sell it, quickly build up your deposit that way. There might be other electronics, gadgets around the house that you might have. Another thing that I've definitely done when buying houses is to sell my car. And this is just because I needed to get the money quickly. That way you can get 10, 20 grand, depending on how much your car's worth, quickly to buy your house, get your deposit done, and then you just buy a, a smaller car, less expensive car if you really still need a car, and that way you can get your deposit built up quite fast. To get started with your first investment property, you're gonna need, I would say, at least 30,000 pounds. Now, this money also needs to cater for stamp duty and legal fees. This will dictate as to what amount of money you can buy a house for, and then also probably which areas you'll have to start to look in, but then drill it down from those areas into which particular areas within those areas, so like the postcodes within those areas. The best way to get a buy select mortgage these days is to go through a broker, and you wanna get a broker that's got access to the whole of the market and kind of has been doing their job for a while, so interview them. Don't just go to a broker and let them dictate to you all the terms that they've got for you to fill in all their questionnaires and all this stuff and then pay them some money even. You can get brokers where you don't need to pay them any money. And I'd push back on any broker that tries to charge you money and keep looking. And this way, if we're all the same, we get rid of these brokers that try to double dip, charge us money, and also get commission from the banks as well. Just taking the mick. Don't go with brokers that try to charge you money, or if they do, just say, I wanna pay zero money, or I'm gonna go somewhere else. You already get paid commission. If they still do, walk away, find another broker. Yeah, that's what I've done lots of times. So find a broker that's got a hold of the market, doesn't charge you any commission and knows their stuff. Been doing it for a few years, not someone that's just wet behind their ears, just done it six months ago, you know, kind of thinks they know it. You gotta interview them, find out what their history is, how many transactions they've done in the last 12 months. When was the last time they did a transaction similar to what you're trying to achieve? And what's the chances based on your scenario that they can get you a loan? And how are they gonna manage the process? Are they gonna be hand-holding you the entire way, which is what you kind of want? Because they're getting paid commission for this, irrespective of whether you're paying them or not, they're gonna be getting a good amount of money from the banks, the lenders, based on the work that they're doing. So you wanna make sure that they're earning their money with it, and they're not just gonna leave you in the lurch. Find out if they've got any holidays coming up over the next six months, and things like that, so that they know they're always gonna be around. How big's their team? Are they gonna be there to support you? Who else is their backup? What's the escalation point if you're not happy with them? All that type of stuff. You know, treat it a bit like a job interview in the respect that you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you about your financial situation. Once we sorted all of that out, we're happy with the broker, you wanna then get an agreement in principle because this agreement in principle, you can then take to the agents and when you're making offers, this is really gonna put you ahead of anyone else that hasn't got their stuff sorted out and it shows you and it will also show you how much money you can actually buy and borrow based on your deposit and the money that you're gonna be lent. You can then buy that type of property, factor in the stamp duty, factor in any legal costs, any bank fees that you gotta pay, any valuations that you might have to pay for as well in the, all of that encompassing amount of money that you need to think about for buying your first investment property. So now we've decided on an area, we've decided on our property, we've got an agreement in principle, now we need to be making some offers. If you're not making offers, you're not making money. So don't be afraid to be making offers because you can always pull out of properties if your due diligence doesn't stack up. And how you work out how much to make the offer is you work out what the buy price should be based on how much it's cash flowing and what return you're looking to make out of that property. To work out the buy price, you take the annual rent, divide it by the return that you want, and that will then equal the offer price that you wanna be making. So for example, let's say the annual rent's 12,000 pounds, you want a 10% return, so you divide that by 0 0.10, which is 10%, that will then equal 120,000 pounds is your offer price for that property. So you make that offer to the agent, giving the agreement in principle, you write up any conditions that you've also got with that property, subject to finance, subject to your due diligence, property inspection, valuation, different conditions. But the more conditions that you put in there, the less attractive your offer is. <laughs> so it's a balance between how much you can really want that particular property. Is it a great buy at the price it's already at? 
or is it something that's been sat on the market for ages, you're lowballing them, you're gonna put all these conditions in because you're prepared to walk away if it doesn't stack up. You make the choice. You can also put in there that you want early access into the property. Let's say you wanna refurbish it, you put in a condition that says, on exchange, I want early access to the property, I'm gonna bring my contractors in there, we're gonna fix it up, and then we're gonna have settlement whenever. It could be 60 days after exchange, or 30 days, and in that time, you're in there fixing up the property while they're still paying the mortgage for it, so to speak, and you're not incurring any fees. So your offer's been accepted. It's not a time to go and pat yourself on the back, sit back, relax, go on holiday. Now, you need to go and check your opinions and your assumptions that you made about that property before you put in that offer and see if they're actual fact. Now, this is called due diligence. So as part of your due diligence, go and check the property again. Go and really walk around at this time, take a clipboard, identify all the rooms, and work out what each of the rooms are like. As in, is there any damp in them? Is the windows all good? Has it been redecorated recently? Maybe there's a reason, maybe it's hiding something. Maybe there's damp, rising damp. Go and check that stuff. Is there mold outside? Is there gaps in the roof? Is any cracks outside on the walls? Any cracks that have been recently filled? That type of thing. This is what you wanna be looking for when you do your second inspection. Maybe take a, if you're gonna be doing some renovating, maybe take a builder contractor with you uh, that can kind of do that assessment with you. You might have to pay them for their time to do that, but this may reassure you they can check in all the nooks and crannies and double check everything's good. You can also get a survey done as well, but if you wanna just quickly get someone around, if you're worried about one particular thing, get that contract to the builder to double check those types of things for you. But if you just want a general one, just get a survey done, or because the valuation isn't really gonna do much about the structure and things like that. It's more a valuation for the lender to enable them to see if it's okay to lend against that property. You know, it's not gonna fall down or anything like that. It's still gonna get their money back based on the loan to value ratio that they're giving you. So, you know, if you're concerned about stuff, get a proper survey done of that property. If you don't wanna spend that, it might be cheaper just to get someone around initially for an hour with you, check it out. If that's successful, then get a building survey done. It's entirely up to you, your appetite for risk, and what you already kind of know about houses and whether you think it's okay to proceed or not. Does anything need to be changed to meet an EPC rating that you might need to get? At the moment, the lowest EPC rating to rent a property is E. That's gonna be changing in 2025 to C. And it's gonna be, and that's just on new tenancies. So on pre-existing tenancies, you're gonna to need to have an EPC rating of C for those by 2028 but essentially work towards 2025 for any new tenancies, especially if you're buying a property untenanted, you're gonna be needing an EPC uh, C rating in 2025. So it's a couple of years away yet, you need to be thinking about that, budget that amount of cost to make those changes to fix that property up and think about that when you're making your offer. And you can put that as the reasoning why you're making your offer the way it is because these things all need to be fixed to meet what you're trying to achieve with a property to meet that EBC rating that's just around the corner maybe. But before you go to exchange, make sure the lender is happy with everything because if you're getting a buy to let mortgage, you wanna make sure that that lender is good to go and has got the money available for you. The valuation is valued up okay. Everything's come fine with the house you know, everything that they needed for their terms and conditions for them lending you the money, make sure that's all satisfied before you exchange, which your solicitor should be checking this for you anyway, but be mindful that you need to be making sure everything's good to go before you exchange and then move into settlement. So once you're happy with your due diligence and everything's set up, you can then move into exchanging contracts with the seller on that particular property. This usually happens in two steps. So you exchange and then you've got a settlement day. It can happen that you exchange and you settle on the same day. I've done this before. Uh, it's the kind of solicitors prefer a little bit of a gap just because they've got maybe multiple things that they're trying to organize. So the settlement date is identified when you exchange contracts. And at that point, you can then work out what you wanna do, how far you want that to be out. It's negotiated with the seller. It's entirely up to you when you make that settlement date. 
Once you own the property, you've got a couple of options. It may be that it's already tenanted and you wanna keep the tenant in place, or if it's vacant, you might wanna refurbish it, or it might be that you're happy with it as is and you're just gonna rent it out because it's owner occupied and therefore you've gotta wait for them to get out until you can rent it out. To find a good tenant, you can do this yourself or you can get a property manager. Now, if this is your first investment property, I recommend that you get a property manager in place to do it for you. I did it that way and then I took on and managed properties myself and then I decided against that and put property managers in place going forward. Now, it depends on your appetite for aggravation, how much potential money you might be saving. It just depends, you know, how you value your time, how close the property is, all those types of things. Definitely your first one, I would get a property manager there just because you want to understand how it should work. They'll kind of handhold you through the process and you can ask them lots of questions while you're doing it. They may charge you between 10 and 15% to fully manage the property, which, you know, you factor that into your costs when you're doing whether the property is going to cash flow for you anyway. Do it at the 15%, the worst case scenario. And this way, you've got someone that's gonna be professionally managing your property for you, which is always good the first time. And then you can decide after that. So once that tenant leaves, for example, you can then say, okay, the next one I'm gonna rent my, I'm gonna manage myself and see how you go, you know. You have to pull together the lease, you have to de put deposits into deposit scheme so that they're saved, you're not touching them, you're not spending that deposit, it's properly saved away and you then have all the calls from the tenant. So anything that goes wrong, they're calling you first and you've got to then either get someone around there or you go around and fix it yourself. So you can, you know, you're saving yourself 15% maybe by doing that, but how many calls you get, how well is the property maintained? So all these things you need to make a judgment call on as you get more experienced, uh, as you're managing those properties, the more properties you buy, the more properties you manage, you get a bit more of a feel for this type of thing. If you've got a busy full-time job, you wanna relax in the evening, you don't wanna be taking calls during the day while you're at work on your property, maybe you wanna get it properly managed by a professional. Knowing where to start can be the hardest step for most property investors. So I've pulled together this video where I look at where you can buy positive cash flow properties for under 150,000 pounds and break it down into which postcodes you should be starting to look in, and maybe some of these are right by where you are living. So go and check out that video now.